Good. First, I should thank uh, the councilman for his uh, very nice introduction. When I get a nice introduction like that, I always uh, think back to one I got a number of years ago when I was lecturing the Soviet Union. My host on that occasion introduced me by saying, uh, Professor Dalek is the author of several distinguished works. They're the kinds of books that once you put them down, you can't pick them up again. But uh, <laughs> I think he had an imperfect command of English, or at least I, uh, I hoped so, you see. I thought I'd um, uh, say something to you about, uh, uh, about Harry Truman and about uh, the Cold War. I've written on uh, Kennedy and Johnson and FDR and short book on Ronald Reagan at one point. But uh, Arthur Schlesinger, who had a series of uh, very short biographies, uh, presidential biographies, asked me if I would do the one on Harry Truman. And I had never written uh, uh, in a sustained way about uh, Truman. And I thought this would be very interesting to take on that project. And part of the, the challenge was, be, was to contain this in 150 pages. Uh, and uh, Harry probably would have complained bitterly at uh, being confined to 150 pages, but no more so than Lyndon Johnson, who uh, had an even bigger ego. Um, Truman, to my mind, is a fascinating figure in the sense that he was the most extraordinary of ordinary men, you see. And he found himself at the end of World War II burdened with this challenge to transfer American power, the American uh, uh, colossus which had evolved out of World War II, into a nation at peace. And the burden on him was in part to continue what people saw as the Franklin Roosevelt tradition. And Roosevelt was seen as someone who had been masterful in establishing rapport with the Soviet Union, and in particular with Joseph Stalin. Now, Roosevelt was a, a master at smoke and mirrors. He was much more skeptical about the likelihood of friendship, easy, comfortable relations with the Soviet Union than he ever let on in public. What Roosevelt believed, to start with this, was that if the United States were going to come through World War II in a mood to participate in post-war international affairs, he had to convince the public that there was going to be a kind of love fest between us and the Soviets. He looked at the public opinion polls. He looked at the fact that in 1943, Wendell Wilkie, his opponent in the 1940 election, the Republican opponent, was sent on a mission by Roosevelt around the world and produced a book out of that called One World. And if you go back and read that book now, it is a fantasy of fantasies. His description of the Soviet Union, of China, are so exaggerated, so distorted. He presents a picture of uh, uh, the Soviets. They, all, they look like Americans. They talk like Americans. They act like Americans. They think like Americans. He says to Joseph Stalin, he said, you're educating your people so well in democracy, you're going to educate yourself right out of a job. And as he says in the book, Stalin laughed heartily, as well he might have at this naive American. At any rate, Truman inherits a burden in which he has to convince the public that this kind of love fest was not going to sustain itself, and principally because the Soviets were so aggressive about defending their interests at the end of the war. Now, as George Kennan later said, the price we paid for Soviet domination of East Central Europe was that they tore the guts out of the Nazi war machine. But Americans were not accepting of that. They wanted the Soviets to retreat back into their own borders, to honor their commitment at Yalta to give freedom to Eastern Europe and to Poland in particular, which had been the flashpoint for the start of World War II. But it wasn't going to happen. And what Truman had to do was convince the public that it was not his fault that we were getting into a bad state with the Soviets, although Henry Wallace, who was the leader of what became known as the Progressive Party, and 
declared himself the legitimate heir of Franklin Roosevelt's World War II diplomacy, Wallace tried to convince the public that Truman was at fault for having provoked this Cold War. Well, Truman now, of course, to flash forward to the present, is seen as at least a near great president. He stands so high in the pantheon of presidents. And as the councilman said at the beginning, the reason is because he was the architect of the containment policy. Now, the intellectual architect of it, of course, was George Kennan, the great diplomat and historian. But Truman, Truman had the wisdom to put it into place. Yet the contradiction is that at the end of his term, Truman left office with a 32% approval rating. Indeed, Harry Truman, in the last year and a half of his term, had a 23% approval rating. It is the lowest, the lowest any president has ever fallen to. Even George W. Bush, Bush and, and Richard Nixon did not fall that low. They got down to, I think, 24 and 25%. Truman went down to 23%. So why is it that he's so admired at this point, and why was he in such bad odor at the end of his term in 19? 52, 53. Well, he's so admired now because the United States wins the Cold War. And whatever people may say about Ronald Reagan's contribution, and he did make a contribution to ending the Cold War, and I'm sure Jim Mann will tell us a great deal more about that. But Truman was the one who put in place the basic approach, doctrine, uh, policy that would really allow us to win the Cold War, containment. The idea being that you can contain the Soviets. You don't need to fight a nuclear war with them. You don't need to overwhelm them in military combat. Their system is so contradictory, it will collapse of its own accord. And he was absolutely right. Why then, to come to this point, and I'll conclude on this, why then was he in such bad odor in 1953? What happened to him? The answer, of course, is the Korean War. In June of 1950, North Korea crossed the 30th parallel. They had in part been provoked by Sigmund Rhee in the South. Both Sigmund Rhee and Kim Il-sung were dying to get at each other's throats. Both of them had the vision of uniting Korea under their aegis, under their rule. Kim Il-sung, a communist state, uh, uh, Sigmund Rhee establishing a pro-Western unified Korea. This war begins, and the United States, which had largely withdrawn from Korea, Truman decides that we cannot let this aggression go unanswered. And so he makes what seems to me the wise decision to enter into the Korean fighting. And led by Douglas MacArthur, who, of course, was the uh, uh, occupying general in Japan, and led by the fact that he reverses military battlefield fortunes in Korea, because the North Koreans overwhelm the South Koreans in the initial fighting. He stages a landing at Incheon, gets behind the North Korean forces, traps them, drives them back across the parallel, and then we make this fateful decision. He and Truman meet at Wake Island. And the question before them is, should we cross the parallel? Should we try and liberate North Korea from its communist control? Truman is skeptical. He has his doubts. MacArthur assures him that the boys will be home by Christmas, that if the Chinese, as it's threatened, come into the war, he says they'll be the greatest slaughter because they have no air power, and we will decimate them. He couldn't have been more wrong. Be weary of these predictions by politicians and military leaders. Harry Truman's great mistake was crossing that 38th parallel. Now, I understand the political context in which that was made. There was fierce pressure on him from Joseph McCarthy, from the right wing in America, which said, we had been suffering a series of fierce setbacks. The Soviets had conquered East Central Europe. 
They had taken over Czechoslovakia. They had staged the Berlin blockade, and we had responded to it with the Berlin airlift. 